السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جمعة مبارك to everyone each and everyone uh, we have a fairly special guest today um, it will be our khatib uh, Professor Aslam Fatah who is actually no stranger to the masjid and to the workup itself and has been a great activist most of his life um, and has been very instrumental in many of the organizations, especially uh, the Muslim Students Association, the Muslim Youth Movement, and is involved still currently in a number of organizations. Professor Aslam Patar is one of our leading educationists in the country and intellectuals, and is currently the Deputy Dean at the University of Stellenbosch, Professor Fatah is also somebody that has contributed immensely in research on education and so on, and is launching on the 8th of December at Islamia, his latest uh, book uh, published by the university, um, the extremely um, good book. I've read through it, and uh, I think it took me two days to read through it, but uh, I couldn't put it down. Uh, so well researched it was. Uh, and I think without further ado, I will invite uh, Professor Fatah to deliver his talk. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most gracious, the dispenser of grace. All praise and blessings are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the universe. We thank and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having guided us to this occasion of Yawm al-Jumu'ah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of us, keep us firm in the, foot, in the footpath and the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My respected brothers and sisters, the waqt of Jumu'ah is a time of spiritual communion, spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the time when we recharge our commitments to goodness, to khair and fellowship, ukhuwa. This is also a time, the time of Jumu'ah, when we figure out how to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a heart free of evil, with a sound heart, what the Quran describes as a qalban salim, it's the moment at which our life's purposes becomes aligned with the purposes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for us. It is also a time when we can perceive very clearly how we should live in the world and how we should commit to a life that strives for salam, for peace and sakina, tranquility. But dear brothers and sisters, I remind you today in this khutbah that thankfulness, the Arabic word is hamd, and gratitude, the Arabic word is shukr, are two of the most important defining qualities of a mu'min, of a believer in his moral makeup and in his commitments to Allah. Hamd, or praising Allah, offering praise and thanks to Allah, and being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all his na'am, for all his favors, are exceptionally important human qualities 
for living a productive life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in Surah Fatiha, in a verse that we recite over and over and over, sometimes we just need to reflect as I am doing right now. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamd. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The verse means, as we know, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the worlds. In this ayah, Alhamd translates as praise, which indicates that we as humans ought to extol Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to place Him on high. Allah the praiseworthy, and we have to give thanks for all His favors bestowed in this world and for the reward for those favors that will be given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next world. In this vein, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said in a hadith, when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds You will have thanked Allah, the Prophet says And he will consequently, Allah Increase you in your bounty When you say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Alhamd Or praise Is rendered In the definite Other words for the linguists the word is not hamd, the word is alhamd, the praiseworthy, to indicate that all forms of praise and shukr and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs to Him. Of course, we know that according to the traditional Islamic etiquette, adab, whenever one is asked how one is feeling, whether you're actually not feeling that well or not, you put a blessing on yourself. And also imbue yourself with a, with a spirit of becoming better, even if you're not feeling well. When someone asks you, how are you feeling? Your answer is, Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah, no matter your condition. In this ayah, Alhamdulillah, the word Lord is used, or the word is Rabb, which refers, Rabb, which refers to the one who puts Matters in the proper order. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the controller of putting matters in their proper order. And therefore, Rabb, in this ayat means that Allah is the master without peer. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala arranges all the affairs of all his creations and to whom all creations belong. The Mufassirin those who explain the Qur'an to us relates the word Rabb or Lord to tarbiya from the same root word to cultivate a, a, a commitment to Allah since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the murabbi again from the word Rabb the caretaker of all things as well as the trainer and the cultivator of our souls our hearts and our spirits. The word Rabbul Alameen refers to Allah as the Lord of all things, the sovereign over every level of creation from earth right through the seven heavens. And so therefore this very simply sounding verse, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Rabb, as the Lord of all things that can be seen and imagined and of all things that cannot be seen and cannot even be imagined by humans. For this reason, we extol Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's praises, alhamdulillah, as the foundation of our submission to Him. If we say that we are Muslim, the next thing we say is alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen for the one who is the master of the universe and the master of all creation. Living in praise of Allah, importantly, submitting to Allah, aligns us to His moral command, to His amr, to His rules, to His command. And His rules in accumulation, when you take it all together, 
provides for us a virtuous path, a good path that our life must take, when especially we have to confront hard choices along this path, that if we are not imbued with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's spirit in us, we may stand a chance of taking wrong decisions along this path. So for example, behavior that is based on praising and thanking Allah is important when we confront the impact of all sorts of things on our lives. Let me think of an example or two. I'd be living amidst what is called on the news climate change and ecological change that affects weather patterns and will affect increasingly where people live, under what conditions they live, in which geographical context they will be uh, exposed to geographical catastrophe and as a result of that geographical catas catastrophe, where people will be forced to live. It is no coincidence that people are flocking to various parts of the world and the answer that human beings are giving to those people flocking as a result of climate change and so on is to keep them out, is to ban them, is to not extend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah to people who are in need. When we are thankful and we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's impact on our life via our thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it opens us up to fully understanding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command would be in a context where all sorts of changes impact on our lives and therefore Allah will imbue us with the spirit to respond properly according to his command. Let me give you one other example of change. It is how technology has now infiltrated our bodies. Affecting what we decide to consume and how we decide to consume it. Here, extolling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's praises are extremely important as a dhikr to remind us that technology must not govern us in the way it currently tends to govern us. Let me give you two examples. One, uh, uh, the first example is a virtuous example actually where technology can be something good. When this morning after I had prepared this khutbah and I have written it out, I decided after, after, after Fajr to WhatsApp it to my family members. And I WhatsApped it to my family members and I WhatsApped it to a couple of family members in the book up. And I was then five minutes later told that the book up WhatsApp groups received your WhatsApp seven hours before you are going to present the khutbah today. And you don't have to come because we've read it. So even the gentleman who makes the khutbah, if he's not careful about this thing and the circulation of messages, he'll become redundant. He won't be needed because the problem with that, the problem with that is it's unfaulted. It could be bad nasiha. Could be brilliant nasiha, wonderful nasiha. But it's not faulted through the human process. Nasiha, when you give it, you must give it to make sure that human beings can relate to it either physically, it's time for you, or I speak to you over the phone, or when I give you a WhatsApp message, there is a conversation and an explanation. It's not just something that comes through your phone, and now you have it, and you see a couple of Arabic words in it, and you think, Allah subhanAllah, this must be good. You read it, you are laid up the garden path. That's the danger of engaging with technology without thinking about it. And that was my unthinking moment this morning. I should have circulated the khutbah after the Jumu'ah, mashallah. The second example, Mechalifs, the brothers and sisters, if I can speak Afrikaans, I won't. The second example is today is Black Friday. I want to suggest to you that Black Friday is fundamentally a novelty created by technology. It's important that when you go through your SMS, Whatsapps, you must tell me how many messages 
you got for this sale and that sale and this Black Friday thing and to spend your money and so on and so forth. Did you ask them to send these messages to you? I don't remember asking the 20 people who sent me messages over the last week to send it to me. The question is, how did those messages land up in my phone? And potentially, potentially, there's always the potential uh, 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 persuading me to spend thousands and thousands of rands, which I probably don't have. I want to introduce a concept which you may know. By the university, Prat ons van the concept of algorithms. The mathematicians will know that. The scientists will know that. Algorithms are those computations, steps, computational steps, that these global companies feed into their technology and into their advertorial campaigns, that they are able to manipulate via our use of social media technology, via our use of Facebook, via our cho choices on Google when we search, or on Amazon when we buy. An algorithm is able to, on the basis of a million transactions that people make all over the world, say for example in Cape Town, everyone makes it. They are able to feed and identify the algorithm to feed what they see are the tastes and the consumption patterns of the people in Cape Town. So next time you open your Facebook or next time you open your, 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 your SMS message, where that message comes from is that it comes from the manipulation of your consumption tastes via what you have yourself done through liking stuff through clicking on things, through choosing certain con consumption things, and so on and so forth, that accumulates. And voila, Khalista brothers and sisters, suddenly you like something that you didn't know about yesterday, and you are in the queue last night at 12 o'clock at game, when they opened up to purchase the smart TV of 107, uh, whatever, 70 meters. It's in your house, or potentially in your car at this point. Khalista brothers and sisters, we consume. But we have to ask the important question, who decides and how does the choices over what we consume, how are they made? Are we in control of those consumption choices? That is why today I'm speaking about alhamd and later on about shukr. The idea that we have to imbue our lifestyle and our patterns with a spirit that and a critical mind that allows us to understand that our behavior is being constructed for us with our tacit permission. The word is tacit permission. Also the active permission for the men. So But we tacitly behave in ways in which the algorithm picks up and feeds us and constructs our tastes. So therefore an attitude of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is crucial in the way in which we adapt to this challenging world. This rapid social disorganization is currently brought on by all of this economic, technological, and social changes. These changes are happening all around us. But they are imperceptible. That's what makes them so, uh, so, so, so powerful. We cannot see it. Yet, when we carefully reflect as we must, we then are able to observe how these changes come to land and impact our body. Our body is not just the physical receptacle of our organs and our ruh and our spirit, our body now has become an extension of a machine. Whenever we answer this machine, this machine becomes an extension of the body. And so the gap between the machine and the body has been erased. When we lived in Hamd to Allah, we have to re-establish the gap between the body and the machine. We live with the machine. But we have to establish a thinking gap between the machine and the body, so that we are not going to now be overwhelmed by living in this context. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points this out in an ayat of the Qur'an, which we all know. It is in an ayat with the title, Surah Al-Ra'ad. And the Ra'ad basically means thunder. It means thunder, donavir. It means that danger is imminent. That's how I'm reading the meaning of the word Surah Al-Ra'ad. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُوا مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily, Allah does not change the human beings' conditions unless they change their inner self. The emphasis in this verse is on developing a moral 
and an educational capacity to adapt to change. As the ayah describes, humans are confronted all the time with the necessity of change. But the ayah says that we have to be ready for it. We can't keep change at the door. But for that, we have to adapt and we have to cultivate and we have to build our psychological, our social and our community responses to these changing circumstances. If we don't, these changes will overwhelm us. That is what the Quran exhorts us in the ayat that I've mentioned. Islam therefore, the Quran therefore, requires us to place the virtue of praising Allah and gratitude to Allah at the moral and the spiritual center of our responses to change. This is the nasiha that I want to give to you today. The only way in which you can draw a line between us and this machine is that if we bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the equation. We must place Allah, the praiseworthy, at the center of whatever we do. Whether in our family conversations, when we sit around the table, bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the conversation about change into, on, on, into the, onto, onto the table. In our dialoguing and in our conversations with our children. In the way we build our capacity to engage with technology. And in the way we develop challenges in the city, such as spatial injustice, harsh living conditions, and social breakdown that we are observing. I end my nasiha, brothers and sisters, today with a related concept, a concept related to alhamd. The Quran offers shukr as a conditioning quality of our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14, verse 7, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَلَأَجِدَنَّكُمْ وَلَإِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ In this verse, two words are starkly juxtaposed to each other. These words are شَكَرْتُمْ or شُكَرْ or gratitude and it is juxtaposed with kafartum or kufr, unbelief or the opposite of gratitude, ingratitude. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayat, and remember the time when your Rabb made this promise known. If you are grateful to me, shakartum, I shall most certainly give you more and more. Look at the beautiful ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are grateful to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us more and more bounty. But, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are ungrateful, verily, Allah's chastisement will be severe indeed. Allah juxtaposes these two, these two qualities. These two, one is a quality, the other one is a negative. And says, this is what will be your path when you follow the path of shukr. But the path of kufr, the path of ingratitude. In this ayat, kufr does not necessarily mean disbelief or not believing. In this ayat, the Mufassirin tells us that kufr means ingratitude. There's an English word for it. A person who is an ungrateful, a, kafir, a kufr, a kafir, he is called an ingrate, an ungrateful person. For that person, there's a destruction. This verse explains that shukr or gratitude is beneficial and that kufr or ingratitude is harmful to us. It reminds us that showing gratitude is one of the most important qualities of our mu'amalat, our relationships with one another and with the inanimate world and the world around us. Gratitude for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's na'am, His favors, being grateful, giving thanks, and just adopting a disposition of thanksgiving are qualities central to Islam's akhlaq, Islam's ethical vision. For instance, our response to overcoming 
the drought in the city. Based as it was, eventually on being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Placed us in a position to develop practices of sharing and caring and fairness in order to deal with the challenges of the drought. Imagine if we had started fighting with each other over scarce, over the scarce water resources. Imagine what kind of bloodbath that would have unleashed. Imagine what kind of racialized bloodbath that would have created. Allah sh- committing, we were able as a community, broadly Muslim and non-Muslim, to extol the virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to display our gratitude within the hardship of the drought, to establish alliances with each other, streets and streets, and communities and communities, to pray in our churches and in our madaris and in our masajid, to beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the virtue of, of His rahmah of rain, to to, to, to developing the kind of cooperation and practices of sharing water resources that we were able to, to deal with the drought uh, in, in this particular country. Only on the basis of shukr. To the person, a shakir, one who is grateful, is acutely aware of Allah's divinity in our lives. The verse, as I explained, juxtaposed shukr with kufr, gratitude with ingratitude, because kufr is the seedbed of our destruction. If we develop a ungrateful attitude to the na'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to what people are able to provide us, we just create a context wherein we invite negative energy from everyone so that that negative energy translates into negative behavior which gets met by further negative behavior. So the advice of the Qur'an is that when you are in a context of adversity, invite positive energy through positive gratitude towards everyone around you. The kuffar are all those who deny Allah's deen, Allah's moral law. They drain our emotional energy. When we are around them, we feel drained and we try to get away. These, the kuffar, are never able to resolve anything. The kuffar, the ungrateful. The kufr, ingratitude, prevents us from accessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, His compassion, and His love. And that is an Allah ordained instruction in the Quran that kufr will lead to, kufr, which is ingratitude, will lead to our destruction. In contrast and in conclusion, a condition of shukr, a condition of gratitude, opens us up to life. Opens us up to a productive confrontation with the human beings, with our earthly existence. And at a very simple level, very, very simple, ordinary level, showing gratitude, opens us, us to others, inviting and embrace. When we are and proceeding through the enormous challenges that life throws up nowadays in all kinds of complicated ways by the example of technology, the example of drought, the example of uh, 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 unsustainable uh, livelihoods because of poverty and the lack of food and so on. Life in that context will continue to throw up more and more and more unrecognizable challenges. It is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in that context that bringing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand, His thankfulness to the Lord into play that will allow us to fuel us, the spirit, to give us the spiritual and the emotional and the psychological energy to deal with our circumstances in this rapidly changing world. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله فاستغفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين. Uh, once again, we say a huge uh, tramakasi to Professor Fatah. And I think the word shukr and hamd is probably two of the words we use every day. But most of the time, if I think of myself without the consciousness of, of the two, as alhamdulillah and, you know, shukran or so on. 
And I think I hope this talk uh, allowed us to think about these words more critically. And so when we say it, we would say it with much more consciousness and, and meaning and, and gratitude and so on. Uh, as we said, Professor Vata have his, um, is launching his book next week. And um, the book is 200 then, but because it's Black Friday, he'll give it to you for 100 then, inshallah. So those of you that are interested or at the later stage interested, please let us know uh, Professor Fattah's book. Uh, we also have a very interesting talk, uh, the Muslim Youth Movement, um, on the 7th at the Slave Lodge, and that is breaking the silence on gender-based violence in the Muslim community, which is an extremely critical talk. So those of you that do have uh, time, please do attend. Alhamdulillah.